Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tilkoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the psychoactive compound known as cocaine. We'll briefly talk about its biosynthesis, but then mostly focus on its mechanism and its metabolic route for elimination in humans once intaken. So first of all, cocaine is a compound that's generated by plants referred to as coca plants. And this is one example right here. A coca plant is any one of the four major plants that belongs to the family Erythroxylaceae, which are a group of plants that are native to Western South America, for example, Peru and Chile. Now, obviously, because of drug trade and things like that, uh, coca plants are now growing in other areas as well, but originally they were only native to Western South America. Now, coca plants naturally biosynthesize cocaine, and if we zoom in here, we can take a look at the leaves and the berries, and it's actually the leaves that contain the cocaine. The berries don't really contain that. And the leaves, we can say, contain anywhere between 0.3% to 1.5% cocaine by mass, meaning they're going to average to about 0.8% cocaine by mass. And what that means is, is that for every 100 grams of leaves, they would contain about 0.8 grams of cocaine. And obviously the cocaine itself can be isolated from the leaf and so that requires an acid base extraction process. Although as we're going to see later in this video, um, in some cultures uh, they don't actually isolate the cocaine, they actually will drink this like an herbal tea. I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes. So let's briefly look at the biosynthesis of cocaine. I'm going to skim through it. It's not really the most important thing here. I'm going to have a separate video where we discuss it in a lot more detail. But just understand that these coca plants are able to do this all by themselves, from scratch, de novo biosynthesis. And the plants are ultimately going to use glutamine in order to do the biosynthesis. Okay? Um, ultimately, this glutamine right here is going to have to be converted to this molecule called putrescine. Putrescine is what we call a polyamine because it's really just a carbon chain with a couple of amines on it. And the putrescine then through a series of reactions such as methylation right here and oxidation of this amine to an aldehyde is going to be converted to this molecule right here which will then undergo an intramolecular cyclization whereby it becomes N-methyl delta-1 pyrrolinium cation. Okay. This right here is the first major stage of cocaine synthesis. You have to make this ringed compound. Okay. Once you make this ringed compound, there's going to be a series of other reactions. So the first thing that has to happen once you have N-methyl delta-1 pyrrolinium cation is you have to attach an acetyl-CoA molecule right here. And you can see that acetyl-CoA becomes attached right here on the carbon adjacent to the nitrogen. Then you're going to attach another acetyl-CoA, so you basically have now an acetyl-acetyl-CoA attached to this carbon right here. Next, there's going to be an oxidation reaction. This oxidation reaction is going to do two things. One, it's going to put a double bond right here between this nitrogen atom and this carbon atom right here. And it's also going to uh, pull off a proton right here, and you're going to get a lone pair on this carbon and you're going to have now an intramolecular cyclization reaction. So basically, the lone pair that's on this carbon is going to attack this carbon right here, and you're going to form a bond. And what that's going to do is generate a bicyclic compound. It's bicyclic because it actually has two rings that are interconnected. Okay, so this is a bicyclic compound. Once you have this bicyclic compound, there's going to be a hydrolysis to remove the coenzyme A a methylation of the resulting oxygen that'll be here to get you this methyl ester, and then a reduction reaction using NADPH to reduce this ketone right here to an alcohol. And this molecule right here is called methyl echgonine. Okay? Um, if you ever look up cocaine on Wikipedia or some other site, they'll usually give you a scientific name, and the name is called benzoyl methyl echgonine. Okay? This is just methyl echgonine, so we're going to have to attach a benzoyl group, and that's the very last step in the synthesis. So benzoyl-CoA is going to come in here to transfer this benzoyl group onto this oxygen right here of methyl echgonine. And so what you can see here is we get an esterification to this benzoyl group right here, and then we have the final product, which is benzoyl methyl echgonine, or cocaine. And so this is the cocaine that's going to be present in the plants, in the leaves specifically, and then the leaves can either be used directly or the cocaine is isolated from the leaves. Okay? 
In terms of the uses of cocaine, most people are at least somewhat aware of how they are abused. And there's two major ways. One is powdered cocaine and the other is crack cocaine. So powdered cocaine is just a powdered form that is ultimately isolated from the coca plants and it's snorted. And so it gets into the blood via the respiratory system. In contrast, crack cocaine is a processed form of cocaine where people take the powder form of cocaine and then they add some ingredients like baking soda and so forth and they make a rock-like version of the cocaine which is smokable. And that's the major difference between powdered and crack cocaine. And because it's smokable, it basically turns the cocaine into an aerosol and then that aerosol is inhaled into the respiratory tract. Now in terms of the amount of the actual molecule of cocaine between powdered and crack form, there's really not much of a difference. But the reason crack cocaine is much more dangerous, much more addictive, and much more potent is because the aerosol form of the cocaine gets into your blood much faster than doing it through snorting or in some cases injecting of the powdered form. Gonna share that crack you're doing or what? Crack? This is cold medicine. No, sir, it's crack. It's not crack. I bought it on a park bench outside a soup kitchen from a guy in a lime green suit. Oh my God, it's crack. And so yes, cocaine is obviously abused as a recreational drug. However, past and present, there are some uses of cocaine that you may not be aware of that are kind of interesting. So right here, we actually have what appears to be an herbal tea, and it technically is an herbal tea, but these leaves are actually from coca plants. And so in a similar way to how you would steep a tea, they're doing the same thing here with the coca leaves. And so the water that's in here will actually pick up a lot of the contents of the leaves. And so it has cocaine in it. Now, of course, the major difference between drinking this kind of herbal tea and using cocaine powder or crack cocaine is the amount of cocaine you're actually getting from this is very, very small. Okay, Much, much smaller than you would be getting from abusing it in the typical manner. Okay. But this kind of drink is actually still consumed regularly in South American countries such as Peru. And then all the way back in 1886, that's when Coca-Cola first came to be. And if you were ever wondering why it's called Coca-Cola, well, the Coca actually stands for cocaine. Believe it or not, the cocaine was contained in Coca-Cola from 1886 to 1903. Um, in fact, the two ingredients, the key ingredients in cocaine, other than the sugar, were cocaine and caffeine. And then around 1903, they were forced to remove the cocaine from it, and it just became caffeine. And so it was not just caffeine that gave you the boost in energy, it was also technically cocaine. So that's kind of interesting. All right, how does cocaine work? Well, in order to understand how cocaine works, we need to get a little bit of basic physiology here. So here's a neuron, and technically this is three neurons, um, because generally each of these neurons is going to release a different type of neurotransmitter. So uh, it's meant to show three different neurons here. It's not all one neuron. But here's the axon. Here's our terminal end bulb. And of course, if we're given an action potential here, um, the neuron can release certain neurotransmitters into the snaps. So some neurons will release dopamine into the snaps, some neurons will release serotonin, and others will release norepinephrine. Now, once those neurotransmitters are in the synapse, they diffuse across the synapse and bind to receptors. However, if you have a way to generate something and release it, you also have to have a way to get rid of it. And so, yes, there are enzymes that can get rid of these neurotransmitters, but one way to also control their levels in the synapse is via something called reuptake. So reuptake is when a protein situated in the plasma membrane of this axon is able to actually move those neurotransmitters back up into the axon. That's what reuptake is. And so it's one way of eliminating those neurotransmitters from the synapse, and they can also be recycled after they're reuptaken. Okay? So the transporter that actually reuptakes dopamine is called DAT, or dopamine transporter. This one is serotonin transporter, or CERT. This helps reuptake serotonin. And then NET is the reuptake transporter for norepinephrine. Okay? And so that's just normal physiology right here. And what that allows is to have a limited level and a controlled level of these neurotransmitters in the synapse. So what happens if you add cocaine to the equation? Well, cocaine is what we call a triple reuptake inhibitor, meaning it re inhibits the reuptake of all three of these neurotransmitters. Reuptake of dopamine, 
reuptake of serotonin and reuptake of norepinephrine. And so what cocaine is actually doing, and by the way, I'm representing it with this C right here, is it's binding to these reuptake transporters and simply blocking them. It's inhibiting them. And so if you're inhibiting these reuptake transporters, what's going to happen? Well, anytime one of these neurotransmitters is going to be released into the synapse, it's going to go into the synapse, obviously, but it's not going to be able to be reuptaken. And so what's going to happen is while cocaine is acting, you're going to have a higher level of all of these neurotransmitters in the synapse. And I tried to show that between these two pictures. Here you have a controlled limited amount. As soon as you throw cocaine in there and you inhibit the reuptake transporters, now you have more of each of these neurotransmitters in synapses. And this can occur all over the body. Mostly we think of this happening in the brain. And in terms of the brain, particularly with norepinephrine, this is going to produce increased alertness, but then also the hallucinations that are possible when high on cocaine are probably more possible due to the inhibited reuptake of dopamine and serotonin. But increased levels of all three of these neurotransmitters in different areas collectively are going to be responsible for the combined effects of cocaine in the brain. And again, there's a lot of effects there, and they're very complicated. And like really any other medication or drug that we talk about, um, the brain is so utterly complicated that it's practically impossible to dissect each one individually. But for now, just understand that it's the increased level of each of these neurotransmitters, it synapses all over the body, but especially in the brain, that's responsible for the collective effects. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention is how cocaine has an effect on the cardiovascular system. Okay? When we talk about the adrenal medulla, the adrenal medulla is part of the adrenal gland, and it releases catecholamines, particularly epinephrine, into the blood. Okay? Now, the sympathetic nerve that controls the adrenal medulla actually releases norepinephrine in order to activate the cells that ultimately dump out epinephrine into the blood. And so if that sympathetic nerve releases more norepinephrine, you're going to have more epinephrine released by the adrenal medulla. So if you have cocaine and it's blocking the reuptake of that norepinephrine, that means there's going to be more norepinephrine in that synapse between the sympathetic nerve and the cells of the adrenal medulla. And so you're going to have more epinephrine release. So overall, cocaine's effect on the cardiovascular system is mediated by its effect on the adrenal medulla. It increases sympathetic output by increasing the release of catecholamines, particularly epinephrine, into the blood. Okay? Now, epinephrine has effects on the heart and the cardiovascular system as a whole. We know that epinephrine is going to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, and increase the force of contraction due to the heart. Now these three things right here are collectively going to increase the oxygen demand uh, by the heart itself, and I probably should have put this bullet point right here. However, there's a problem. Cocaine also causes vasoconstriction and coronary spasm, okay? and so it's ultimately going to lead to diminished oxygen supply. So the heart has an increased oxygen demand. It has a decreased oxygen supply, so it's more likely to have ischemia or ischemia. That's basically when the heart is starved of oxygen, or at least it has diminished oxygen supply. And what happens when the heart has diminished oxygen supply? Infarction. So basically a heart attack, death of cardiac tissue, and that can lead to death. Interestingly, this is actually how Elvis Presley died. Because cocaine causes an increased oxygen demand, and then also causes a decreased oxygen supply, therefore ischemia and infarction, um, it ultimately weakens the cardiovascular system. And so Elvis is known to have died on the toilet, and you won't really find this most places. You have to dig a little bit, but basically he was trying to use the bathroom. He was trying to defecate. And sometimes when you're having a little bit of trouble, you push, and you do with something called the Valsalva maneuver, whether you realize it or not. And when he did the Valsalva maneuver, it caused too much stress on his heart because it causes increase in thoracic pressure and increases the heart rate and force of contraction. It's basically the same maneuver you actually do when you do a squat in the gym or do a deadlift. And it put too much stress on his heart and he had a heart attack and died. Okay. So again, he was a cocaine user, so um, he had a weakened cardiovascular system which predisposed him to that. Normally for most people, doing that kind of maneuver on the toilet would not pose any threat. 
One other thing that cocaine does is it actually acts as a local anesthetic. And there's actually derivatives of this, like Novocaine, that are actually still used in dental offices that has a similar mechanism to cocaine. And what it does is it decreases sodium transport at neurons. It basically inhibits sodium channels. And so if you're inhibiting sodium channels, um, then you are inhibiting action potentials along those neurons, and so they can't fire. And this is particularly notable in uh, pain receptors and also other kinds of sensory receptors. And so oftentimes when people are doing cocaine, or especially crack cocaine, which is more potent, they often report being numb all over the body. Now, of course, if this is used as an anesthetic, which it actually has been used in the past before it was outlawed, um, it was used as a local anesthetic. It was simply injected into the area or topically applied to the area, and it would simply numb that area because it decreases the activity of sodium channels. All right. So just understand that cocaine is a triple reuptake inhibitor, and all of its effects, except for the sodium channels, are pretty much mediated by the increased level of neurotransmitters in the synapses all over the body. Okay? Now what happens if cocaine gets in your blood? Obviously you have to have a way to metabolize it and then eliminate it. Now the metabolism is done primarily through these two enzymes right here, the first of which is a serum esterase called butyryl cholinesterase. This is a broad specificity esterase found free-floating in the blood, it's a plasma enzyme, and any ester that gets into the, into the blood, potentially as a xenobiotic, is metabolized by this enzyme. Another molecule that's metabolized by this enzyme is actually heroin. Um, butyryl cholinesterase can actually get to the esters on that. Now in the case of cocaine, it's actually this benzoyl ester that it targets primarily. So this bond right here between this oxygen and the benzoyl group is hydrolyzed by butyryl cholinesterase, and you get this metabolite right here. Now because the benzoyl group is removed, you actually make this molecule a little bit more water soluble, and so this can be directly eliminated by the kidneys. And so about 45% of cocaine is, is eliminated via this enzyme. The second enzyme here, which is called hepatic carboxylesterase, is responsible for the next 45% of the metabolism and elimination. And what this enzyme does is it targets this ester right here, the other one, not the benzoyl ester, and it removes this methyl group uh, from the ester. And of course that's going to generate a carboxyl which is more water soluble uh, than when it had the methyl group on there. And again, this occurs in the liver, not the serum. Now this metabolite of cocaine, again, is water-soluble enough to be removed via the kidneys. And collectively, butyryl cholinesterase and hepatic carboxylesterase account for 90% of the metabolism of cocaine. The other 10% of the metabolism is due to this pathway right here, which is 5%, and then the rest of it is just other minor pathways. So cocaine can also react with this N-demethylase, which is an enzyme that's going to remove this methyl group from this nitrogen right here, generating just a regular secondary amine. Okay? And once this occurs, we then have butyryl cholinesterase again, which is also going to remove this benzoyl group as we did up here. And that's going to generate this metabolite, which again accounts for about 5% of the metabolic uh, destruction of cocaine. And again, it's water soluble enough to be eliminated via the kidneys. And there are some other minor pathways that will account for the other 5%, but this right here is the vast majority of how cocaine is metabolized and then eliminated renally. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how cocaine works, how it's biosynthesized, and also its mechanism of action and metabolism. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.